Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Beatles news briefs, your home for the latest real clear Beatles news and information. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci. Later in today's show, we'll have a discussion with my longtime friend Al Sussman, executive editor of Beatle Fan and the author of Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation, and Beatles news briefs contributing news editor and the author of the book Beatleness, Candy Leonard, and myself about the time between... November 1963 and February 1964 as it relates to the Beatles. But first, a little news. Paul McCartney is among those seen in the documentary Jimi Hendrix Electric Church that will play in limited theater engagements around the country. Uh, It was announced January 22nd. It will open at the Arclight Hollywood Theater on January 31st with a special Q&A that will include engineer Eddie Kramer, who worked with both Hendrix and the Beatles, among many others. The documentary, which has already aired on Showtime, tells of the Jimi Hendrix experience's involvement as headliners of the second Atlanta International Pop Festival. Billboard reported that the top-selling vinyl album artist in, in 2018 was none other than The Beatles, who sold 321,000 copies. The biggest seller was Abbey Road, which finished the year as the fourth largest seller with 76,000 copies. They had two other albums in the top 15, the White Album at number 11 with 56,000 copies and Sgt. Pepper at number 13 with 50,000. Former Wings drummer Steve Holly will be part of the reunited Mott the Hoople when they tour the states for the first time in 45 years starting April 1st, Billboard reported uh, January 22nd. Ian Hunter, as you recall, was a former Ringo All-Star and we saw... Uh, Ian on that tour, and it was a great tour. We also saw Mott the Hoople in the 70s when they were headliners. The two openers for the show that we saw at the Winterland Arena in San Francisco, from the bottom up, believe it or not, were Aerosmith, who opened the show and were just starting out, and Bachman Turner Overdrive. And now, some chart news. From officialcharts.com in the UK, dated January 24th, The top 100 albums at number 75 is the one album down last week from 62. In the vinyl top 40, number 32 is Sgt. Pepper down from 25. 39 back on the charts is Abbey Road. And 40 down from 24 the previous week is the White Album. And now our guest, Beatle fan executive editor Al Sussman, along with Beatle News Briefs contributing editor and also also the author of Beatleness, Candy Leonard, and myself discuss the months before the Beatles broke in the States. After that, I'll be back with This Day in History. For this segment, um, I'm going to have two very special guests. Let me first introduce uh, the contributing editor of Beatle News Briefs, Candy Leonard, back again. Hello, Candy. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you and all your listeners. Uh, And we have a special guest, and this is kind of like a reunion almost. Not a Beatles reunion, but uh, maybe a a reunion. I'd like to welcome the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine, Mr. Al Sussman. Al, welcome. And and formerly uh, formerly, uh, my partner on a previous podcast. Right. Right. Hi, Hi, Steve, and hi, Candy. Welcome, welcome, Happy Al. Happy New Year to both. Hey, of you. Al. Happy New Happy Year to everyone. And Happy and New Year. and it's been it's been a while since we've talked, but I thought yes. but I thought what we would do is that we would, being that we are again in the the middle between the time the date of the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And the explosion of Beatlemania in America, and the upcoming anniversary of the Ed Sullivan Show, which I actually have a have a rather short title for. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's you called, hit, they're yeah. called Changing Times. That's right. You and you you wrote a book about that. Um, right. And what was the subtitle? Uh, 101 days that shaped the generation, and that's where kind of where we are right now. And, right. And I thought maybe uh, that between Al and Candy and myself, we could discuss the 
uh, this this period with some different perspectives. Al, of course, his book goes into historical perspectives. Candy in Beetleness talks about sociological perspectives. And me, I, mm-hmm. I guess I will just add whatever perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start. Let me let me start though with Al, because I mean, you're you're talk about your book first of all, and what and and the the basis of your book and and what your book deals with for people just to to let people know. Uh, it, it basically deals with the 101 days between beginning November 22nd, 1963, and ending March 1st, uh, 1964, which obviously takes in the assassination of President Kennedy and the Beatles' breakthrough in America, but also a lot of other things that happened during that time that either that either immediately forged change, like, for instance, the Civil Rights Bill, which, um, which passed the House and was being uh, literally hand-delivered to the Senate, at the end of the the period that I was that I was dealing with, uh, the Surgeon General's report on smoking, which was the first government sponsored report that that said in effect that smoking will kill you. Right, and, and, and that came out just as we the Beatles entered our lives, smoking in every yes. scene and picture we saw. Absolutely, absolutely. Every time I see a picture of George Harrison puffing on a cigarette it uh it really really angers me well not only george i but you know oh, how sure. many how many fans took up smoking oh, right. because of them, because it was so cool right, right. yeah so anyway i didn't mean to yeah. interrupt no no, no 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 that's not no that's fine so, Kenny. things like that which you know which either uh as i said either you know immediately forged change or kind of began the process mm-hmm. of it so it's not just so that I'm really clear. The book doesn't make a direct connection between, and I know a lot of people have interpreted it that way, and and I think I actually have in the past to some extent that the the assassination of Kennedy did not factor in to Beatlemania. Is that no? In fact, in fact, if if you were to go back and look at old pieces that I that I did for Beatle fan, particularly back in the 80s mm-hmm. and, and 90s, I actually bought into that whole uh, that whole way of thinking that um, uh, that, the, you know, that the, the country was in, uh, you know, a state of uh, suspended animation in deep mourning for a month uh, after the assassination and, and that it took the Beatles to bring us out of that and it just was not the case because once i you know kind of since the problem is that no it seemed like the that december 1963 in particular Mm -hmm. is like this boomer's black hole that nobody remembers anything about i mean before i started doing the research the only things i remembered about that month were frank sinatra jr being kidnapped Mm. And and the NFL championship game between the Chicago Bears and the New York Giants. That's it. And uh, that's and not the, that's not the Heidi the Heidi game, is it? No, no, no. That's uh, okay. uh, that was sixty eight. That was the Jets. Oh, okay. But the uh, uh, but the uh, but that that's all I remembered, and most people didn't even remember that. So uh, so I when I started doing the research for this, that was. One of the main things that I wanted to find out was what went on, what actually did go on in December of 1963, and it was it was very it was very different. You know, the the, the country actually by the second week in December had really begun just you know going on. You know, despite the very deep psychic wound of the of the assassination, mm-hmm. you know, the, the country really began, was, you know, s- continued to function as, as normal. And especially the youth of America, uh, you know, we, you know, we, we pretty much bounced back, uh, mm-hmm. you know, as, as would be normal in, in a case, uh, you know, especially in that era where, you know, unless there was a 
particular tragedy in our families, right. we tend to bounce back a lot quicker from from a kind of like from a national tragedy like that. So that the you know that the, the that equation just doesn't work because you're talking about six weeks between you know between the assassination and that weekend following it and the breakthrough of the Beatles in America, uh, you know, or, the, or actually the breakthrough of, of I want to hold your hand in right. the first week in January. There's about six weeks there. Mm -hmm. So that that equation just doesn't work. Well, I actually have a kind of a different take on this. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, you know, like you said before about, you know, bouncing back from events like that. I mean, there really had never been an event like that. So yeah. in, in some sense, we don't really know. But I, I don't think it's a matter of, oh, everybody was depressed and they made us happy. I, I think it's, I mean, that, you know, that may or may not be true for some people. But I think mm -hmm. that the, the it's more nuanced than that, because I think, um, you know, if you think about what Kennedy represented in terms of youthfulness and vigor, as he liked to say, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> forward lookingness and the citizen of the world and all, there was a um, similar vibe, if you will, a similar kind of uh, presentation almost between the Beatles and JFK. And so mm -hmm. it's not that they cheered people up so much, but I think on some level, they seem to, um, I don't want to say replace, but they seem to, they had some of these same qualities, the youthfulness, the embrace, you know, the, if you look at the press conferences, uh, you know, with Kennedy and his famous bantering with the press, mm -hmm. very, very similar to what we saw with the Beatles, even fr from the very first one at, at the airport. So mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, sometimes I refer to it as like a new, new frontier, you know, and the other thing where I think there are some similarities is that Kennedy, you know, if we think about the Peace Corps um, and some of the speeches he gave, he was always about the need for a youthful perspective and, mm -hmm. and a kind of, you know, he, he embraced the power of youth and he saw this generation as, you know, he didn't want to, you know, the, the whole idea of the Peace Corps was that it wasn't going to be, we're going to send these young people all over the world, not as soldiers, but as, you know, engineers and, and you know, and, and people who are going to help, you know, in these other less developed countries. So I, I think that the whole mm. youth thing, I think, um, is a similarity there. So, you know, mm -hmm. to say, well, you know, the assassination cause, you know, Beatlemania wouldn't have been as big if Kennedy wasn't, you know, this is not knowable, of course. Yeah, right. Exactly. But, but I think that if you, you know, the idea that something was lost and something in some ways similar was then found i mm -hmm. i stick by that yeah i i i think that's uh that's totally reasonable yeah you you think you, you think that's that's a legitimate argument Al? oh absolutely absolutely because i mean yeah. there's no que there's no question that the that the country was was really depressed i mean i remember God and I was and I was living in Massachusetts at the time. They were devastated by this. Right. I mean, right. you know. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, it was it was terrible. And oh, sure. I remember some of, a couple of interviewees um, for Beatleness talked. You know, they remembered. You know, like events being canceled, like dances being canceled, and mm -hmm. you know, certain curtailments of certain kinds of activities. But I don't know. I mean. The, I mean, obviously, this is just like historical accident that this happened the way it did. Um, I often wonder, you know, had Kennedy not been assassinated, would he have had the Beatles at the White House? You know, because yeah. he was always, you know, they were they embraced the arts and they were, you know, kind of, you know, all about what was happening. And who knows? He, you know, they might have uh, paid him a visit in Washington on that snowy day you know when yeah. they went that's down a, there. that's an interesting thought i i never that never occurred to me before that he might have that he might have done that but yeah he might he that, i guess you could really make an argument for that i mean you could imagine him getting a kick out of them right and mm -hmm. again because of his whole the whole youth thing you know and and i don't know it's just it's something i i 
have thought about once or twice over the past 50 years. <laughs> I can't I can't remember. I know, I know he did have musicians. Yeah, all the, the time. Um, he had uh, he had Nat King Cole there just a few months before. Did he? Um, I was going to yeah. uh, the uh, the name that came to mind I believe was Pablo Casals. I believe yeah. he had Pablo Casals there. So, mm-hmm. I didn't I don't I don't remember Nat King Cole, but I'll take your word for it. I mean, if that if if he really did, and I, b- I believe you're right, then that makes the argument even stronger that he would have done something like that. Yeah, so. Natalie Cole, in fact, in the liner notes to the uh, the Unforgettable album, uh, she mentions the fact that uh, uh, that um, that Kennedy had uh, had had Nat had Cole Nat there King. in wow. uh, in like October of '63, oh and my. that. Uh, and that supposedly that Sunday, that summer, which was his hit at that time, was a particular favorite of uh, JFK's. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's... But, you know, if you think about them as people who embraced the arts and saw the mm-hmm. arts as part of, a, you know, as a cultural resource or whatever, that, you know, you can sort of imagine that that could have happened, you know? Yeah. More More Jack than Jackie, though. I don't know that Jackie would have been a Beatles fan, but... Although maybe with the kids, I mean, with 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 Caroline and and John Jr. Well, they were they were pretty they were pretty young. Wait now, just a minute. She and I are the same age, and I was <laughs> so. You know, we, I I have to say this every interview I do. I feel like I need to, you know, say this again that we forget that many first generation Beatle fans were literally children. Oh sure, mm-hmm. you know, and so, you know, the, and you know that had many different, you know, the fact, the fact of, you know, so so they affected people of different ages differently, obviously, but who knows, mm-hmm. you know, we some, you know, some has an opportunity to interview Caroline Kennedy, they could, you know, ask her that. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask you if you had if you had had any contact or if you had seen anything to that effect uh, about her and the Beatles. No. No, not her, but Leonard Bernstein's daughter, Jamie, was a huge Beatle fan. She was around that age, too. She was also, you know, a, you know, in elementary school age. Mm-hmm. Huh? You know, they were just these four fun guys. You didn't think of them in any sexual way or, or even, you know, people that age really didn't have a frame of reference for pop stars. Like, we didn't know about Elvis, even like Ricky Nelson and these other crooners. Like, we didn't really know about that. But suddenly, the Beatles mm-hmm. appear. And they were just like four guys who were just fun. You know, it was just all about the fun and the music and dancing and being part of this larger cultural conversation that made children feel really empowered because you were well versed in this and you could, you know, you, you go to Thanksgiving dinner at your um, relatives and people, oh, these, well, it wouldn't be the year we're talking about, but in general, in other words, family gatherings, people mm-hmm. talking about the Beatles, as adults did, you could chime in and be part of the conversation, you know, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but, but, yeah. but getting back to this, what I, I call that period a corridor between the JFK 60s and the Beatles 60s. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this yeah. sort of period where what we're discussing, where it was like, you know, sort of may or may not have been a dark period of mourning. I think I remember, is it in Shout, I think, where he talks about um, the sales, that retail sales were lower that Christmas. Am I remembering that right? Well, actually, uh, actually, they really weren't. Yeah, the first um, week, uh, week to week and a half after the assassination, uh, sales were down, but by the first week in uh, the uh, by the first week in December, they had rebounded quite a bit, and uh, and that's why in the middle of the month, Time Magazine did a piece called uh, in the it was like the the lead piece in their national news section uh, called the State of the Nation, and the point they made was that uh, was that to a great extent. The country had started, you know, moving, moving again as, you know, as per normal. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, in fact, uh, the New York Times did a piece that you could tell it started out as being it was a local piece uh, about the New York area and about the supposed lack of um, 
uh, Christmas displays and things like that. Mm-hmm. And and the the further the reporter got into the uh, got into the piece, the more he noticed that actually it was pretty much as per normal. Mm-hmm. You know that the there was this, this pretty much the same number of displays in most uh, in most neighborhoods. This would have been again second week in December. Right. All right. Uh, with with the you know with the statement that Al made earlier that there really was no direct connection between what happened in November and what was happening in February. Did did um, but it, it, even if you say that, can you can you completely dismiss the the um, the positive feelings that came out of Beatlemania as not maybe a, a even a slight reaction to to what had happened or kind of a recovery? Can you? Well, I think actually what Candy was saying makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. that they that they they were kind of a continuation if you were if you will of the you know of the the kind of of young looking young thinking new frontier and, and there they, also the, the global aspect of it yes you know, sort that of, too yeah and they also changed col- the culture of not only of here but of all over the world i mean they made a they overhauled uh, culture was I mean really got modern in a hurry? Is that is that not true, Al? Well, I mean it took you know like sort of swinging London didn't really emerge until really you know I'd say sixty five. Candy, would you? Yeah, agree I'd, with that? Say, I'd say late sixty five ish. Well, yeah. musically, musically, number one because of the Beatles' influences, they, oh, yeah. they brought. The fashion, I mean, London became a fashion center of the world mm-hmm. by, certainly by 66. I mean, Time had that cover story on Swing in London. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you look at the way the Beatles are dressed in um, Help and you think about like the Kinks and, you know, these other, the, the Carnabitians, um, <laughs> that was already, I think that was like, late, you know, that was already 65, I think. Yeah, you know, that was early mm-hmm. to 65. What what about again getting back to the music? What about the the way the Beatles, especially with with um, uh, R, their the R and B influence? Um, because a lot of that was not there before the Beatles came in. Um, well, of course, people would say that the Stones or the Yardbirds right. or the Animals had more have much more of an R and B influence. Well, that's true. That's true. But the Beatles really kind of. I mean, don't you think the Beatles kind of started that off? You know, actually, I I read a really interesting book recently called the. Oh, I can't remember the the name of it now. But he talks about the um, sort of the spiritual aspects of sixties music and all this. And he made mm-hmm. the author made a very interesting point. He said that I should remember the name of this book because I, I was I highly recommend it. He said that the, one of the things about the Beatles and the Stones that that he explains um, how they both had their roots in black music, mm-hmm. but the Stones took the um, you know the more bluesy aspect, which was sort of slightly darker, right? And it was about, yeah. you know sort of woe and misery. Whereas mm-hmm. the Beatles took the gospel piece, and it was more positive and uplifting. Hmm. And I thought that that was a really interesting analysis. Yeah, that is mm-hmm. that is that is interesting. That, yeah, because of the, I mean they basically took, you know, I mean look at what they recorded, uh, you know Chuck Berry. Um, Little Richard, and you know it was all, it was all that kind of. Whereas you had, and also kind of uptown, uptown R and B, you might say. Mm-hmm. You know, people like you know, like, like the Isley Brothers, and and the, you know, the early the early Motown material, things right. like that. Right. And, right. You know, like, and the girl groups, of course. You know, a lot of the you know the Brill Building material from the girl groups. Mm-hmm. Where where the Stones had songs like "Pain in My Heart," um, yeah, you know, right. time, "Time is on My Side," 
um, mm-hmm. you know, that, which which were a little more, you know, downhearted than than what the Beatles were doing. Not as mm-hmm. uplifting. It's, it's all over now. Right. That kind of perspective is very interesting. I'm when, trying to find the name of that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, Al, how did where did things go once the Beatles once the Beatles hit? Where did think where did things go? In in what sense? Well, in in in, in the historical sense. I mean, to, I'm I'm actually getting outside the realm of your book a little bit, but culturally and and musically, where did where did things had? I mean, basically, I mean, everybody kind of took off in 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 a, you know developing music i mean that's where music really took off was starting with that with with what the beatles did right well i mean you know that, that yeah that that's kind of a myth that um uh that i that i tried to kind of uh, pop in, in in the book was that uh, uh especially some of the early rock histories that came out in like the late 60s and very early 70s mm-hmm. painted the period between say 1958 and the release of I Want to Hold Your Hand as being this barren period of nothing but teen idols and dance songs and uh, and novelty records. And yeah, in like, you know, 1959 and 60, there was a lot of that. But beginning in 61, where you, where you had this 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 real renaissance in R and B, particularly with the you know the the Brill Building writers mm-hmm. and Atlantic Records and you know the New Orleans sound was beginning to really to really develop, and Motown was beginning to uh, have th- their first successes and even what Stacks. became what became Stax mm-hmm. exactly where they were beginning to have their first uh, their first successes as well. And, you know, so so really by 63, there was, you know, there was a very, a very, ri- and, and, and you had to throw the folk revival in there as well. Right. Great. Right. But, you and know, so, I think. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, was, I think the impression that, you know, like this sort of, you know, this myth that you're talking about, that there was no good music is partly because if you think about white America listening to radio, mm-hmm. right? A lot of all the things that we were just talking about were not there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, there were girl, you know, the girl groups, I guess, were being played on the radio. So that was kind of a little, you know, a genre that existed in that interim period. But you know, a lot of the developments were, were, you know, the the quality music that was coming out then was not necessarily as widely uh, listened to as you know the, the all the male crooners i when i do my powerpoint i have like five slides of these guys. i mean there was so many of them you know? but. so that's what we heard so i think that 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 impression like oh nothing was happening i think was maybe fueled by you know a certain sort of uh narrow view of mm-hmm. what was happening mm-hmm. and yeah. if and if you and if you look at the charts between 64 and then progress into 65 and 66 i mean things started really cooking at that point you know there were some well yeah i mean 65 i i make the 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 contention that i to me 1965 is the single greatest year in the entire history of rock and roll you know it's interesting how many different books if you if you look through amazon how many books have been written about specific years yeah. Saying each of those years is, you know, is great. I mean, I, I right. I'm not going to argue, for example, with the fact that '68 was a a huge year. But that was newswise. I mean, I remember, you know, '68 was an explosion as far as things go. But musically, musically, I mean, there were there were some crazy things going on. 64, 65, 66. Oh yeah, I mean our, our friend, our friend Andrew Jackson, right, did a right, really nice book on 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 the music of 1965, mm-hmm. and uh, because you know, because you had you know not only the British invasion really at kind of high tide, but also you had this you know what you might call the you know the American rock and roll renaissance, mm-hmm. yeah, where, 
had all of these all of these groups that had begun forming right in the wake of the Beatles right you know like like the birds and like the turtles and uh, you know etc the love and spoonful etc cetera, etc cetera. I think and, it was absolutely a renaissance I mean yeah. you know beginning I mean you might even say late 64 but certainly 65 mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think Andrew's book really um, makes a very good case um, mm -hmm. And he also talks about the drugs, which are really a very important part of the story. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just, let me just, I, I found the name of this book. It's, ah, called, yeah. it's called Into the Mystic, The Visionary and Ecstatic Roots of 1960s Rock and Roll. I've heard, and I heard of that. It, it just came out, didn't it? It came out in September 2017. So it's okay. fairly new. Okay. And the author is Christopher Hill. It's a really, really interesting book, and I highly recommend it. Okay, I'll Ooh, have to. I'll have to look. I'll have to look that up on uh, Amazon for Kindle and see, and see uh, and consider getting that because yeah, that sounds that sounds really good. Um, any other? He's got this weird obsession with pretty ballerina, which I thought was kind of interesting. <laughs> wow, there's that's an, that's interesting. Wow. But that's uh, no, a good book. It's huh? very interesting. Okay. Um, do either of you have any other points you want to make? Um, is there anything we left out? Um, well, about 65, you know, I have to say this is not a Beatles thing. Go but ahead. I think one of the important things in 65 musically was uh, satisfaction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a complete game changer. The Beatles could not have, would not have, and could not have done that. Ooh, no. boy, that's an inter that's an interesting, interesting thought. No, you're probably right on, on that particular song. They probably couldn't have. Not that kind of a record. No, right. Uh, that would not. It was definitely not the kind of record that the Beatles, the Beatles would have done. You know, yeah, even though, yeah. You know, even though you know, even the even though they had a a similar, uh, you know immortal guitar riff later on in the year in Day Tripper. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, that riff that, you know, that Keith Richard basically dreamed uh um, right. you know, is 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 immortal. And and that record, uh, you know, uh the that was even with all of the great stuff that was out during the summer of sixty five, it that was really the summer of satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was one very monumental song I remember. And what's weird is hearing the stereo version of that. It doesn't sound as good as the mono. No, it's it's like hearing <laughs> I want to hold your hand in in stereo. Oh, I don't so, mind I want to hold your hand in stereo, no, but but, that, but, that but, should, but it should but, never be heard in in stereo. But satisfa <laughs> satisfaction honest. satisfaction in stereo is awful. I mean, yeah, it's it really is. dreadful. Whereas in 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 mono it's very powerful incredible yeah. you know because a record like satisfaction was just it's not the kind of a record that that the beatles would have made okay it's not. i mean there's no way i mean you know it's funny because when i you know i think about some of the great rock and roll songs of the last 50 years i mean thinking about stones again you take a song like start me up all right so like an mm -hmm. incredible great song the beatles Again, could not have, would not have. I mean, uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash is a better example. Right. I, same, I that, would say the same thing. that song, that song, I can I can say with certainty is one that the Beatles would not have done ever. Right. So, right. No. No, what, are no, you no. disagree? Are you disagreeing? No, with no, that? no. I, I'm saying no. They would not have. Okay. <laughs> they would not have. You know, that's yeah. another one. That's, it's just stylistically. It's just you know. It's that's that's you know kind of the difference between the two, the two bands. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to, really. It's 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 style. But the satisfaction was enough in the mix, you know, where the Beatles were still develop not developing, but they were progressing, to where you can say that they weren't going in that direction. They no, not not at all. I mean, the, the whole debate that I guess probably still goes on: Beatles versus Stones. Beatles, sure. you know, it's really kind of silly, and if you think about it, oh, because they, they had they were not they had you know the, the one song they sh you know the, the, the Beatles you know like I want to be your man. They gave them that song. Beatles, you know, chose not to record it, and they 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 diverged. You know, they there was they they were not 
they didn't have the same mission. I mean, they did. They were just different, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, they gave when yeah. they when they decided to record it, they gave it to Ringo. So, right, you know, yeah. I mean, I'll you know the the that whole thing of the Rolling Stones being quote unquote the world's greatest rock and roll band is nonsense. They were never the world's greatest rock and roll band. So we know they weren't the world's, the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 60s. We know who that was. Mm-hmm. They weren't the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 70s. That was Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. They weren't the world's greatest rock and roll band in the 80s. That was <laughs> probably you too. <laughs> and and after that, it doesn't really matter because, uh, you know, they... Because the world stopped. Now, I mean, I'm sure there are people who disagree with you. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I would say that the Stones could have a claim of that if if only because of when, their when longevity. when candy in the 70s uh, i mean maybe just from today i'm not sure but i mean I, I think that you know the stone's longevity is really quite remarkable and what's less remarkable is that they didn't really evolve or change in the way that that's the thing I mean, the stones were the stones were the stones they're still the stones right. You know, I was I was did an interview the other night with somebody. We were talking about how the Beatles kept changing, and and how people mm-hmm. of our generation came to accept that our art, you know, our favorite artists, and they were artists. They <laughs> evolved, they changed, like Bowie did, and like Joni Mitchell did, and and others. The Stones didn't really do that. No. And one foray into it in psychedelia, like it was like wearing a sh- a shirt that didn't fit you. You know, I'm like, talking about emo- emotional rescue. No, I'm talking about uh, Satanic Majesty. Oh, Satanic Majesty, oh, which yeah. I actually think is a great album, by the way. But it didn't. It wasn't. It didn't suit them really. See, yeah, I, it it, has, if you, it's got its moments, but it uh, it's not what it what they kind of were intending for it to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're talking about a, a good a good period of the Stones, I think the Mick Taylor years are are phenomenal. I love that. Yeah, I love that yeah. period, mm-hmm. and I and I almost would argue with you about. Who, which one, which was greater, the Stones or Zeppelin? But because Taylor was just so phenomenal, you got to remember the Led Zeppelin was absolutely massive in the seventies. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. And I still, I mean, I listen to, I listen to Led Zeppelin more than I do the seventy Stones. But um, you know, I think live they were, they were phenomenal. But you know, I've, I've, I've heard. You know, tapes of both, and both were great in those days. There's no, there's no question about it. Oh anyway, yeah. Anyway, anyway, people, i uh, Al. It's been great talking with you again. Yeah. And I hope it's been we great I hope, talking with the two of you. I hope we do this again, Candy. Thank you yeah, again. It was fun. It w- it was fun, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. On this day in history, on January twenty second. 1963, the Beatles appeared on three UK radio shows in one day. Pop In, which they taped at the BBC Paris studio on Saturday Club, taped at the Playhouse Theatre in London. And then they finally returned to the BBC Paris studio for the talent spot where they recorded Please Please Me, Ask Me Why, and Some Other Guy before a live audience. January 22, 1969, the Beatles moved from Twickenham Film Studios to Apple Studios in London to start recording the Get Back album. January 22nd, 1977, Paul McCartney's Wings Over America hit number one on the U.S. album charts. January 23rd, 1969, the Beatles recorded the first two takes of Get Back. January 24th, 1958, the Quarrymen made their only appearance at the Cavern Club. January 24, 1962, Brian Epstein signed his management contract with the Beatles for 25% of their gross revenue, more than the usual 10%. January 25, 1963, the VJ label obtained a contract to release a limited number of Beatle records in the U.S. January 26, 1970, John Lennon and Phil Spector wrote and recorded Instant Karma. Born on this day on January 23, 1910, guitarist... Django Reinhardt, who doesn't have a direct Beatle connection, except we figured that George Harrison had to have been a fan because his technical style had a lot in common with Reinhardt. And born on January 27, 1947, Nedra Talley of the Ronettes, who, as you know, opened for the Beatles. 
And a quote from Bob Dylan, They, the Beatles, were doing things nobody was doing. Their chords were outrageous, just outrageous, and their harmonies made it all valid. But I kept it to myself that I really dug them. Everybody else thought they were, for for the teeny boppers, that they were going to pass right away, but it was obvious to me that they had staying power. I knew they were pointing the direction that music had to go in my head. The Beatles were it. That's it for now. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com. Thanks, Matt. And Beatles-arama. Thanks, Pat. And also on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast. Join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in Beatles news and, and information in the Beatles world. And check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or for your favorite people. And please subscribe. We would love to have you aboard, and you, that way you find out our, about our shows as soon as they appear. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying, Be seeing you. that one market fab